Hiya, Frank. You look like you got troubles. Anything a neighbor can do? Looks like I got transmission troubles. The engine stalls just as I stop for a traffic light. You're a mechanic, Cliff. You got any ideas? Hmm. That's just about when she shifts down. Yep, it does sound like the transmission. But why don't you drop the car off at our service department in the morning and let us take care of it? You just got a customer. I'll be in bright and early. So I told him he was on the right track about it being the transmission. After all, it did take place during a downshift. It sounds to me like you're sort of new on this transmission work, Cliff, my boy. You ever think that this condition might be caused by the engine idle speed being too low? Idle speed too low? That's right, Cliff. That idle speed is mighty important. If the engine doesn't turn over fast enough, it might stall when you bring the car to a stop. On the other hand, too high an idle would cause the transmission to upshift too slow. Is that so? Well, then, the first thing I'd better do is check this idle speed, right? Right, me lad. Use a tachometer and set the idle speed at 475 RPMs with the transmission in neutral. And none of this guesswork, either. Say, hey, that idle speed was low. The tack read 400 RPMs. She's okay now. That's probably what caused the engine to stall. Now, what would you say was the cause of an engine miss just when the piston moves for the upshift at about uh, 13 to 18 miles per hour? That has to be a transmission complaint. Wrong again, Cliff. That miss is a warning that the ignition system isn't quite up to snuff. Ignition? Well, how can the... Uh-uh, I don't get it. Well, the way I see it, it's probably caused by the small electrical drain on the primary circuit when the interrupter switch closes. You're right there, Carl. And that drain will take place on upshift even with the governor points open. Remember, Cliff, that drain is normal. It doesn't ordinarily cause the engine to miss. So if I ran into this miss on the upshift, wouldn't I start out by checking the ignition circuit? Yep, that's right, Cliff. And the best place to start checking is in the ignition wiring for clean and tight connections. That's a good point, Cliff. If a check of the wiring doesn't turn up the trouble, then check the rest of the ignition system. On these hydraulically operated transmission jobs, I usually clean and gap the spark plugs first. <laughs> okay. I'm pulling in my horns. I'm convinced. But what happens when the transmission fails to downshift? That's transmission trouble, isn't it? Sure is, Cliff. Nine times out of ten, you'll find something wrong in the transmission electrical system. The importance of clean and tight connections that we talked about in the ignition circuit applies to the transmission circuit, too. How come? Well, if a connection was loose in the transmission circuit, Cliff, there'd be a lag in opening the solenoid ball valve for the downshift. But don't forget, a downshift at too low a speed could be the fault of the governor. That's right, Tack. But it's a lot easier to check the connections before blaming the governor. We might mention a clicking circuit breaker right here, Carl. Okay. You see, Cliff, if the circuit breaker clicks off and on, it's a short. Either the red wire from the circuit breaker to the solenoid is grounded, or the brown wire to the anti-stall control is grounded. Say, Carl... Why don't you show Cliff how to check out the governor and solenoid circuit? It's a good idea, Tech. He's got to learn sometime. Now, checking this circuit is like checking a plugged water pipe with a lot of faucets in it. You keep checking the faucets till you come to one that doesn't give water. The trouble is between that one and the last one that did give you water. Don't forget to mention that the ignition switch is turned on for all of these tests. That's right, Tech. Now, here's the way I make the checks, Cliff. Connect one lead of our test light to the battery terminal of the circuit breaker and the other lead to a good ground. If the light does not come on, the trouble is in the wire from the circuit breaker to the ignition coil. In that case, you would repair or replace this wire. Now, 
If the light does come on, that's your signal that everything is okay. Uh, up to that point. And now we go on to the next check by moving the lead to the solenoid terminal of the circuit breaker. If you don't get a light there, replace the circuit breaker. If your light comes on, the circuit is okay up to that point. For the next check, move the lead from the solenoid terminal of the circuit breaker to the red wire terminal of the solenoid. And if the light doesn't come on, the trouble is in the red wire, right? Right, me boy. And if the light comes on, I know that the flow of electricity is okay all the way from the coil to this red wire terminal of the solenoid. You're on the beam, Cliff. Now you go ahead with the next step. The next step is to disconnect the yellow wire from the solenoid terminal and connect the test light lead to that terminal. If your light doesn't come on, the trouble is probably in the solenoid. So, remove it and test the solenoid with the battery. I see. But if the solenoid tests okay with the test light, then the circuit is okay from the coil through the solenoid. That leaves us with just the governor to check. Yeah, that and the yellow wire that connects the solenoid to the governor. So, disconnect the yellow wire at the governor and connect one lead of the test light to the end of the wire. Connect the other test light lead to ground. Right. That'll check the wire from the solenoid to the governor. If you don't get a light there, repair or replace that wire. And if the light comes on, we know we've got a complete circuit to the governor. So if the transmission still won't downshift, the next point to check is the governor. On the nose, Cliff. So, now we remove the governor cover, lift off the switch arm and contact plate, and inspect the points. You clean those points with a clean cloth or a small brush dampened with carbon tetrachloride. But don't ever file them or use an abrasive. Them points are silver, and rough treatment will ruin them. Do you ever replace the governor? Not just for bad points, Cliff. If the points won't clean up, you replace the cover and switch assembly. If there are other conditions, however, which can't be repaired, then you'd have to replace the governor. There's another condition of failure to downshift when you'd have to check the interrupter switch circuit. Yeah, but that's when the engine is under load. <laughs> well, I'm mighty glad I got curious about Frank's car. You can bet your last buck I'll know the answers next time before I sound off. Good boy, Cliff. And now if somebody will turn this record over, I got something new to show you. Bill's working on a transmission with a pin-type synchronizer. You fellas know about it? I know about the plate type synchronizers, Tech. We've had those for some time. But this other type is new to me. That's the pin type, Carl. Both types do the same job. Maybe we can get Phil here to explain the fine points of assembling this pin type synchronizer. Take over, will you, Phil? Sure thing, Tech. Let's start by putting the thrust washer and the first speed gear on the main shaft. Notice that the gear goes on the main shaft with these clutch teeth up. Then, we put on this front thrust washer. And be sure you use the right thrust washer, the one with the smaller inside diameter. Right, Tech. The washer used with the plate-type synchronizer fits too loose on the main shaft for use with the pin-type synchronizer. That washer will shift just enough to block the clutch gear sleeve so that the splines in the sleeve and the first speed gear won't engage. Which would make it difficult or impossible to shift. The clutch gear goes on next, but before we put it on, you have to match the index mark on the clutch gear with the index mark on the clutch gear sleeve. Then, with a piece of chalk, put index marks on the other side of the clutch gear and sleeve so you can see them after the parts are installed. Now, separate the clutch gear from the sleeve and install the gear on the main shaft, making sure that the slightly raised section on one face of the gear is up. Hey, where's the clutch gear snap ring, Phil? Well, this pin-type synchronizer doesn't have a clutch gear snap ring, Carl. Now, when you come to these stop ring assemblies, be sure to inspect the cone faces for nicks or other damage. Nicks can pick up small particles of metal or dirt which would interfere with proper synchronizing action. You've probably noticed that there are two identical stop ring assemblies. So, 
Install one of them now, pins up, in the first speed gear. Next, slide the clutch gear sleeve on the clutch gear with the stop ring pins extending through three of the holes in the sleeve. And be sure the sleeve is installed so that the extended part of the sleeve is up. Here's where those chalk index marks come in handy. Indexing these gears is important. This clutch gear is selectively fitted to the clutch gear sleeve in the position which will give the smoothest action of the sleeve on the gear. Next, we install the other stop ring assembly so that the three pins enter the remaining set of holes in the clutch sleeve. We install the outer steel synchronizer stop ring, the rear thrust washer, and the bearing roller thrust washer in that order. Put the blocker ring over the clutch teeth on the third speed gear and slide this assembly on the main shaft. Next, install the first set of 36 bearing rollers between the main shaft and the third speed gear. Insert the bearing roller spacer. After the spacer is in place, put in the second set of 36 bearing rollers. Then slide the third speed gear thrust bearing assembly on the shaft. And be certain the bearing race with the largest inside diameter is installed first. Right, Tech. And now we put on this thrust bearing washer and the snap ring. And right here we have to check the clearance between the end of the stop ring pins and the face of the opposite stop ring. We make this check to make certain that the pins on one stop ring don't drag and cut into the opposite stop ring. To make this check, push the clutch gear sleeve up on the third speed gear. Make sure the sleeve is all the way up so that the front stop ring is seated tightly in the outer steel synchronizer stop ring. Hold the sleeve in this position and use a feeler gauge to check the clearance under the pin. The minimum clearance should be 18,000 and the maximum 60 thousandths of an inch. What if this clearance is less than 18 thousandths, Phil? Well, in that case, remove the stop ring and carefully dress off the ends of the pins until you get the right end clearance. A piece of abrasive paper placed on a surface plate will do the job. Then, fit the two rings together in their normal positions to see if all the pins are the same length. If they aren't, you'll have to dress the long pins until they are all the same length. Don't forget to round off the ends of the pins after you get through dressing them down so they won't dig into the surface of the opposite ring. Then you reassemble the gears and rings to the main shaft and check the clearance again? Right. And when the pin clearance is okay, check the clearance between the third speed gear thrust bearing washer and the snap ring. Got to have three to eight thousand. The thickness of the snap ring controls that clearance, you remember. Right. Well, from here on, the assembly procedure is the same as with the plate type transmission. Don't forget about lubrication, Phil. Oh, yes. Remember to use only 10W engine oil and fill the transmission to the bottom of the filler plug hole. She holds about three pints. Well, Cliff, think you can work on this pin type synchronizer now? It's a cinch now that I know about these new parts. Say, Tech, why don't we talk about that new internal expanding parking brake while we got this transmission handy? You must be a mind reader, Carl. I was going to ask about that. That's new, isn't it? It sure is, my boy, and it's a beauty. It's an internal brake, fully enclosed to keep out dirt and oil. It works so easy, even a woman can lock this brake as easy as she can crack a neck. That's right, Tech. And this brake is used on all models having hydraulically operated transmissions. It has two self-energizing shoes which resemble wheel brake shoes. What about adjustments, Carl? Well, there are two adjustments, both very simple. First, shoe clearance is adjusted by this brake shoe adjusting nut. And second, the cable adjustment is made by a jam nut on the cable housing. These adjustments must be made while the propeller shaft is disconnected because you have to turn the drum by hand to tell when it turns freely. The first step is to turn the shoe adjusting nut to expand the shoes until they're tight against the drum. Back the nut off until it locks in the groove of the sleeve and then back the nut off two more grooves or stops. Then, if the cable has been disconnected, Insert the cable and housing through the cable guide and tighten the guide clamp bolt just enough to hold the cable housing in place. Compress the coil spring on the cable 
and slip the ball end of the cable into the slot in the brake shoe operating lever. Be sure the washer at the end of the spring is on one side of the operating lever with the ball end of the cable on the opposite side. Now, loosen the cable housing jam nut, push the housing through the guide as far as you can, and tighten the clamp bolt so the cable spring won't push the housing out of the clamp. The cable will push the operating lever against the shoe and force the shoe out against the drum. Then, tighten the jam nut as you turn the brake drum by hand. At first, you'll feel the drag of the brake shoe against the drum, but the drum will gradually free up as you tighten the jam nut. When the drum is free of brake drag, tighten the cable guide clamp screw securely and be sure the jam nut is snug against the end of the cable guide. If a lock nut is used behind the jam nut, tighten the lock nut. Finish up by trying the parking brake for proper amount of travel. When adjusted properly, the parking brake should need from four to six clicks of the ratchet to hold the car. Well, Cliff, that about does it. Do you have any questions about this internal expanding parking brake? No. Looks like you did a good job of covering the adjustment. Whoa. Look at that time. I gotta hit the road and quick. Well, so long, Tech. And don't forget to drop in on us the next time you hit town. It's a date, men. I'll be seeing you. So long. Oh, <laughs> my